Exploitation manager of Fascination Soap. We're promoting a national beauty competition to find Miss Fascination of 1951. Class stuff, you understand. Recognize beauty queens only. No rubbish. In short, Mrs. Clark, that's why I'm after your daughter. All expenses paid, and if she wins, a check for 1,000 pounds, a genuine mink coat, and a three month film contract in dominant films. And if that isn't a gift horse, then, lady, I never met the animal. Oh, Marge, did you hear that? In 1946, the British film industry was at or near the peak of its success. Cinema attendances were higher than they'd ever been before or indeed would ever be again. And the number of films in production was about to be raised from around 40 a year to more than 100. Confidence and optimism abounded in every area save one. Britain simply didn't have enough stars to fill all these films. We had Margaret Lockwood and Gene Simmons, we had James Mason and Stuart Granger and a few more, but not many more. And so the question was, where were the necessary new stars to be found? Well, at this point, enter one J. Arthur Rank, a staunch Methodist, a millionaire, and the man whose organization controlled 60% of the nation's cinemas and more than 50% of its film production. He was, in short, the first and come to that the last tycoon of the British film industry. And film tycoons are, of course, on a par with God and can therefore do anything. And so J. Arthur said, let there be stars. And lo, there came into being overnight, if not stars exactly, than at least an outfit whose avowed intention was to create stars, to find and groom young talent for the topmost pinnacles of stardom. And J. Arthur looked upon his work and found it good and decided to call this outfit the Company of Youth. But the press, gazing thoughtfully and cynically into its collective glass of gin, came up with another and more mocking name for it, the Rank Charm School. Mrs. Clark, there are three million girls in this country between the ages of 17 and 23, hurling themselves down the same blind alleys. Dancers, speedways, films. Worshipping at the altar of Gene Simmons and Betty Grable. Living by proxy. With what at the end of it? Marriage. To some factory worker or counterhand. Yeah. Eh? Seven years to live and then the kitchen sink. I'm offering your daughter a chance of escape. To be strictly accurate, the notion of training talented newcomers for films originated with the producer Sidney Box when he was running the Riverside Studios in London just after the war. He put a number of carefully chosen actors and actresses on a small retainer and set about shaping them for stardom. Some of them had draw dramatic school experience anyway and we persuaded people to let them go and watch other productions being made. We tried to give them the biggest uh, insight into filmmaking and acting as we could. In 1946, Box joined the Rank organisation, taking his protégés with him. And there, under the director of artists, David Henley, and his assistant, Olive Dodds, the original company of youth was developed to include young people of no previous experience and often of no discernible talent either, from teenage girls to men just out of the armed forces. Sometimes there were as many as 20 or 30 of them, all under contract at about £10 a week. But what exactly was the rank organisation looking for in this motley lot? Well, I think they were looking for star quality, really. I mean, their idea was to follow the sort of trend that Hollywood had always set up. I think they wanted to start a, a, a school for stars. They were basically looking for the look part of it, uh, a look-alike thing. You know, they were sort of choosing a girl like um, Constance Smith because she looked just like Hedda Lamarr. Um, and all the others seem to look a little like someone else, you know. Who did you look like? <laughs> I was told that I looked like Sally Gray. I think I was supposed to look like Gene Simmons. I think Christopher Lee, he used to swear he was James Mason. Well, what about Dinah Dawes? Who was... I think Di was one of the few really individual people that they had the good sense to pick. But if anybody, I would say probably Greta Gint. Before acting, we were looking for photogenic quality and personality and the desire to do it, you know. 
the desire to be a film star, not so much an actress, I have to say that, because many of the, the young women particularly, it, it was the glamour of being a film star, and this is quite understandable. Just down the road from here is the site of the old Highbury Film Studios in North London. They were torn down quite a long time ago now. But when Rank acquired them towards the end of the war and put a man named John Croydon in charge, they formed a fairly significant part of his organisation. From Hollywood, to which he always seemed to look, not unnaturally, I suppose, for his inspiration, J. Arthur had learned the value of B pictures, cheap quickies which conveniently completed a double bill and also served as a useful training ground for technicians as well as actors. And so from the Highbury Studios came a succession of such instant and instantly forgettable little movies, movies like Penny and the Pownall Case and To the Public Danger. And the cast of these and similar other equally unmemorable horrors were recruited largely from inside this rather bleak church hall which being handily situated close to the studios had been taken over by rank to house, somewhat incongruously, his charm school. I figured, well, if all the starlets, as they call them, went there, well, then it was going to be a very glamorous place. Uh, it was obviously uh, very luxurious with chandeliers and, and plush carpets and all these sort of things. And, uh, well, why not? It, it would all be exciting. It was dirty <coughs> and scruffy and there was a piece of sacking across one corner, and that was the boys' changing room, and a piece of sacking across the other, and that was the girls' changing room. And I, maybe, uh, maybe my memory has gone peculiar on this, but I don't think there was a loo. <laughs> I have a feeling there wasn't a loo, and if you wanted to go to the loo, you had to go to Highbury Studios, which was about a few yards up the road. It was run by a dreadful harridan of a woman called Molly Terrain, who struck fear and terror into everybody. Her claim to fame was that she had coached Jean Simmons in the early days and that she'd gone on to do all sorts of wonderful things and that Jean Simmons never made a move without Molly Terrain and because Jean Simmons was the number one sort of starlet then, you know, and who, who, who really, we all knew that she was going to be a great big superstar. We thought, well, if she likes Molly Terrain and she can't move without Molly Terrain, we must all sort of do what she says. She always wore a straw hat with a cherry that dangled right over the front, which bobbed up and down when she became slightly excited, which she frequently did. And she didn't spare people, but then she understood as a psychologist that sometimes it's necessary to frighten somebody into giving a performance. She was horrific. She really put the fear of God. I mean, she put the fear of God into the girls particularly. They were petrified of her. I mean, she was madly insulting. And she'd tell you the truth, you have no talent and I don't know why I'm wasting my time with you. I mean, it's not exactly conducive to making, getting the best out of anybody. She didn't um, pander very much to, to um, egos and, um, and, and the nervousness, I think, probably, and the, and the worries and ambitions of youngsters. You know, if you're there and this is your chance, you, it's, it's a worrying time, really, however much you might... But, and I don't think Molly necessarily... I don't mean she was unkind, but... The work was all important. Take tea at home of my heart and rest. Home keeping hearts are happy est. Very good. I'd get on a bus, a number 19 bus, which went to Highbury, uh, and get there for 10 o'clock in the morning. And then you'd start doing play reading and uh, walking around sometimes with books on your head, fencing. Uh, you'd stop for lunch. You'd come back and you'd do uh, voice production, breathing exercises, uh, sort of a, a semi kind of a dancing thing. People would sit around and they would read Shakespeare and they would read plays and they would read the classics or indeed modern plays, contemporary plays. And most of the people there had no idea whatsoever of timing or how to read a sentence or how to make anything out of anything. Who shall blame them? They had no experience. They had no background. You can't expect somebody to jump straight into a reading or straight into a part and give a marvellous definitive performance. All they can give is an instinctive performance. The, the idea was that we, should, we would learn cinema techniques. Um, well, which really wasn't true at all. I, I mean, really what it was is that they got a lot of very pretty girls and maybe 
out of all those pretty girls, they'd, they'd find one that could act a little bit. Uh, and in fact, they did find some pretty good girls out of that lot. But uh, really, for the men, it was an awful waste of time. I was not prepared to walk around a room with a book on my head, which a lot of the girls had to do and a lot of the men, because they simply didn't know how to move. The place was full, not just of, of, of a handful of us who, who wanted to learn to act, but every time a beauty queen won a prize, you know, part of it was um, a, week, a month's trial at the charm school. And I think we must have been very generous, nice people, because we spent a lot of our time helping these people, because they might have got a film contract out of it, you see. And then suddenly, after a few months, you thought, wait a minute, what am I getting out of this? And it wasn't a lot. I can remember on one occasion being there, because it was at the old Highbury Studios. And Jay Arthur, if you'll excuse the expression, was there himself, uh, clocking us in. And I was 10 minutes late, and I'd always been early, and, and I got a severe reprimand. It was all like being back at, really, back at school. Another rule was because uh, J. Arthur Rank was a strict Methodist and did not approve of smoking and drinking. At any party, premiere, club, or wherever you were photographed, publicity-wise for the Rank organization, you were never, ever allowed to be seen with a glass in your hand. It didn't even matter if it was lemonade. And the head publicist, Theo Cowan, I can remember him on many occasions darting in to a gathering where I was sort of grabbing glasses from people and putting them out of sight for fear that any star would be thought of as even enjoying a drink, never mind being a drunkard or anything like that. In those days, we were still slightly concerned that people behaved like young ladies and young gentlemen. And I, I, I remember on one occasion when I was in Knightsbridge, I was in a taxi actually, and I saw Diana, who was then about, I suppose, 17. It was a gorgeous day, lovely sunny day, and she had on very short, red shorts, white shoes and a blouse, which did nothing to hide her very attractive figure and her swinging hair. And she had a brown paper bag full of cherries, which she was eating out of the bag and spitting the stones in the gutter. I thought this was terrible. <laughs> so I asked her to come and see me <laughs> and um, said, you know, this really wasn't the way a rank starlet should behave. After all, she was beginning to be known and uh, really couldn't have this on. <laughs> When I was told this thing about if you don't behave and you don't do as you're told, you'll be put into purda, it was like being put into solitary confinement, uh, rather, you know, if you were in a prison. I mean, in so much as I don't think anybody spoke to you and you were looked down on and you weren't allowed to appear in a film, which was part of the idea of the grooming uh, of the charm school, that when you were not doing anything and you were being paid all this money every week, uh, it was rather a way of keeping you out of mischief, I think, which wasn't a bad idea. But uh, if a film company wanted you in, uh, for a small part in a film, not only was it experience, but it was also gradually uh, progressing as far as becoming a star one day was concerned. But if a film company asked you and you were in Perda, you wouldn't be allowed out. I'd always dreamed all my life of being a film actress, a film star, you know, and to suddenly wind up at this church hall with, with all this sort of grim reality, it was nothing to do with glamour and films as far as I was concerned. I couldn't wait to get into that studio and, and act. Hello, Auntie. Hello, dear. Could you possibly help me out? I haven't got enough money to pay the taxi. I'll run clean out. Well, yes, of course. Bag. All right, Mum. I'll fix it. Well, come in, Duck. Oh, it's sir. Let's have your bag. Now, what's going on out here? It's Diana Jo. She's just arrived. Hello, Uncle. How's yourself? Nicely, thanks. Why, you've got to be a big girl, haven't you? Have I? Hello. Well, bigger than I expected. Well, perhaps you'd like a nice cup of tea after your journey. You're dead right, I would. How's your mother, love? Terrible. Shouldn't be surprised if she pegged out. They did have one idea, which was a very good one, which helped a bit, and that was to send us to the Connaught Theatre in Worthing in Sussex, which was administered by the rank organisation. So they tried out a lot of their contract players in varying parts, some big, some medium, some small, in terms of getting experience in the theatre. But I always thought that the main intention of the rank organisation, with its contract players, was films rather than theatre.
You couldn't get a film because you were at the charm school, because they wouldn't take you seriously in the film business. You did a play, and if you had by permission of the, the rank organization, you had that, they had that feeling, oh, well, he doesn't need any help anyway, because he's, he's got them behind him. So you couldn't win. Whatever happened, you couldn't win. If they could build rank starlet, Diana Dawes, rank starlet, Barbara Murray, whatever, and the pictures and so on, and they got free publicity photographs, and we helped, I mean, our publicity department, um, and we were paying them, so we didn't uh, demand a great salary. It was quite good publicity, and this was terribly good for the, for the school, because they were really acting with an audience, and without that, I don't think you could ever, even on films, I don't think you could ever really get the feel of, of acting. Soon her face will be as well known as Rita Hayworth or, or Betty Grable's. She might even marry an Indian prince or a dance band leader and go to Hollywood and have a colored maid in a swimming pool. She'll be a star. You must remember that you're no longer just a soap queen, my dear. You're a film starlet now. Now, the soap people are only interested in publicizing one thing, cleanliness. In films, the range is much wider. We'll start you off at the Glamour School tomorrow, and we'll take a few pictures of you at work there. But I'm going home on Friday for a week. It was agreed. That's right. Oh, we've lots to do before then. We shall want you on Thursday for the charity premiere with the rest of the girls. What, don't you never get no time to herself? When our starlets are not training, they're expected to attend first nights, open fates, launch ships, small ships, of course. Yeah, but when, when does she act in films? Ah, uh, that's not create a precedent. For some extraordinary reason, one would be sent for to open a fate or declare something open or whatever. Um, and you'd never been heard of, you'd never done anything, but as long as you were a rank starlet, that was all right. The idea was that these appearances should enhance their, you know, att attractive value, and so one would... We were inundated with requests to, to open everything, you know, from shops, dogs' home, unmarried mothers, launched ships that would sink, anything. Um, and you, you know, you assess these to some extent and say, well, that's really not worth doing, or that's out of date, or we should have done that yesterday. Uh, some were easy to get out of. And um, then you um, said, oh, well, this is this, this, well, this one really should be done. All these places we went to, we had the uh, script written out for us. And I remember one, it was a baby contest, and in the script it said I had to say, it's very, very hard to judge the one that should get the prize because they all look just like prospective film stars. <laughs> the further you got from perhaps the centre of more sophisticated London, the more just the idea of, you know, work to be opened by a well-known film star, and that was enough. And, and people didn't feel terribly cheated. I suppose if someone turned up, who was obviously if it was a girl, a pretty girl, and there was some identity, say, so, well, she played a small part in, a, I don't know, alligator named Daisy or something like that. Um, that was enough, I suppose, because maybe, maybe actually people wanted wanted their symbols. The stars and their fans take a day out. At the Sunday Pictorial Garden Party, 25,000 cinema goers keep a date with their screen idols and no introductions are necessary. Everybody in the business went to it. I mean, whether they were the rank organization, Corder, ABC, or whether they were just freelance and out on a limb, it was the star event of the year. Matula Clark comes very near to a ducking at the hands of Donald Houston, aided and abetted by Jane Hilton. It was like a bear garden. It was the most incredible thing to go to, taken round in trucks. It was really amazing. People queued up for totally unknown people. I mean, obviously, the stars were there as well, but then we were there in force, and we had to go and do our stint, and they queued up for absolutely nothing. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it's beyond the... I don't even understand it at all, but I suppose they were brainwashed into saying, well, these will be stars one day. The press were terribly interested in, in, in the charm school people, and um, rank organisation didn't sort of object. If it was just a straightforward publicity thing, it was useful training again, and very good publicity, I think, for the rank organisation at the time. You are to be in pictures you're wonderful to see you are to be in pictures oh what a hit you would be your voice would thrill a nation your face would be adored 
you'd make a great sensation with wealth and fame your reward and if you should kiss the way you kiss when we are all alone you'd make every girl and man a fan worshiping at your throne you ought to shine as brightly as Jupiter and Mars You are to be in pictures My star of stars Seems mildly astonishing now that in that first incarnation of the Charm School in the late 1940s, the press and the public appear to have an all-devouring interest in the activities of Rank's little starlets. Miles of newsprint were devoted to pictures of them simpering coyly or to detailed descriptions of their not terribly exciting lives. Thousands of people would clamour for their autographs at public garden parties or wait for hours in the rain to watch them turn up for movie premieres, even though the starlets themselves hardly ever appeared in films. They were, in fact, an early example of people who were famous for being famous. Now, why should that be so? Well, for one thing, they represented glamour, a commodity in very short supply in that post-war age of austerity and rationing before television had ousted the cinema as the opiate of the people. And for another, one of the lessons that Rank had learned from Hollywood was the value of publicity. So here at the organization's headquarters in Mayfair, they knew that every time a rank starlet was identified in the public prints as a rank starlet, the name of rank was impressed ever more indelibly on the public consciousness. The starlet herself might remain known vaguely as what's a name, but the name of rank would be remembered. And so sometimes it seemed that as far as the charm school was concerned, publicity was actually much more important than filmmaking. <laughs> It's London's Film Night of the Year, as executives and their stars arrive at a West End cinema for the Royal Command Film Show. So let's join our cameramen and catch the early arrivals. The Charm School girls were very good for publicity for all our movies. They dressed the premieres, which were, at that time, every week there was a premiere. Any function at all, they came to it, looking as pretty as, and charming as they could. And we did get a lot of coverage for all our movies because of them. You had to attend premieres, uh, and as we had no clothes to wear, which, were, which would make the newspapers, because you obviously had to turn up at the premiere looking very glamorous. They're not like they are today. If you have a film premiere, you can wear any old thing. This was good because, you know, it, it added excitement and glamour to the business. So what used to happen was that we would be given or loaned evening dresses to wear to premieres, which had been worn by, say, Margaret Lockwood or Greta Gint or Phyllis Calvert in all their films, because they were the big stars. And depending on your measurements, you'd be, you'd be loaned out these fabulous dresses, a bit like Cinderella going to the ball. There were about, I should think, four or five different fur wraps, and you had them alternating, you know, between various people under contract. And you'd be like, oh, she's got the fox this week. I was living at home, and my roles came to the door, and I got in with a borrowed mink, and, a, and all the neighbours would look, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd be going to collect my escort, or, and then I'd duly come home in the roles, you know, much to the relief, probably, of <laughs> the, <laughs> the neighbours. Tell me about the very first premiere you went to. I shall never forget it. It was the first day of my contract. Uh, and it was called The Egg and I, with Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray. And uh, I was so frightened and scared. And I had a very uh, old, tiny, sort of girlish uh, evening dress, the only one I had and I wore that. I remember being taken out to some frightfully smart nightclub. I'd never been to one in my life before. And I danced with Trevor Howard. <laughs> and I just thought if the girls at school could see me now. <laughs> he was sweet and it was wonderful. It was very, very exciting. One of the things about personal appearances is, is that it will, they, they did have a slightly serious side because, you know, these artists were, were you know, hoping to be employed and hoping people could, and, and if you don't see them, someone says, my gunny and I saw so she looks marvellous. I, I saw that girl at the premiere, um, which, is, which actually is, is often much better. It's, it's our marketplace, isn't it? The evening reaches a glittering climax as the royal party makes its way up the stairs for more presentations. 
The chances of being spotted at a premiere by a producer or director with nothing but work on his mind were quite remote. But the rank organisation did present its starlets with another and ostensibly better opportunity to show off their looks, if not their talents, because every week they'd be summoned to a cocktail party given by the director of artists, David Henley. He would invite producers and directors and would discuss with me usually and, and Molly Terrain youngsters at the school who were perhaps beginning to show signs of development or we felt needed a little push. They didn't all come every time or anything like that. They were, as it were, selected. The starlets were invited. They were made to go along to these parties and mingle with all these people in the hope, we were told, that one of these directors might sort of see something fantastic in one of us or be casting a film or whatever. There would be the Michael Powells and all the big directors of the time. Uh, they were forced to come. They didn't want to see us. We, we wanted to see them, but we knew they didn't want to see us. And the result was always the same. Everybody was very charming and very courteous, but you could see at the back of the eyes, it was the same reaction. Nobody's heard of you. You have no experience. Why should we think you've got any talent? So even meeting them socially didn't really break the ice. I personally have my own ideas about those parties, but you see, as I was only 15, and I'd been more or less discovered in the first place by a film producer called Sidney Box, uh, who was at Gainsborough Films. Uh, he had sent a memo, because I was very advanced for my years, as probably you seen in various photographs of me. I mean, I looked much older, uh, but I was only 15, and he sent a memo around to everybody in the rank organization, which said, keep off under age. So I never went through this awful business of casting couch or men making passes or anything like that, because I was under 16 and everyone was terrified. And of course, they all remembered Sidney Box's memo. This concept that uh, producers only got to see you you know, there were very many more gorgeous big girls than I was, and I used to be spotty and gangly in a corner and know that nobody would ever discover me that way. I'd better get out and do it. Well, this, of course, was what they were all trying to do, poor underemployed things. Actually using the charm scholars in films seemed to figure pretty low on Rank's list of priorities. Though a few, Diana Dawes, Christopher Lee and Peggy Evans among them, managed to appear in one or two of the B-movies made at Highbury Studios. Mostly it was Olive Dodds who promoted the interests of her charges when casting time came around. I used to read all the scripts that were going to be made, and if there were parts that seemed to me to fit Susan Shaw or whoever, um, I would say to the producer, what about, like an agent, I acted really like an in internal agent, and they'd say, oh, no, 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 it's not experienced enough. Or they'd say, yes, we might, let's have her up and have a talk to her. They weren't going to take the risk, and you can't really blame them, of using untried, inexperienced people uh, in a film because these untried, inexperienced people might show their lack of talent, which is no fault of theirs, but it could stick out like the proverbial sore thumb, and that might not be a good idea from the point of view of the whole conception of the film. So what they, in effect, said to us was, you have no name, you have no experience, you aren't... Um, particularly good. We certainly weren't. So we can't use you. I can always remember meeting Peter Ustinov, who was directing a film, and I went into him, and he spent the entire interview not asking me about my experience or what I could do, about asking me about what happened at this extraordinary place in Highbury, you see, and he, which he found extremely amusing. It wasn't of any great consequence whatsoever to us, because, in fact, to say you, you came from the rank school, forget the word charm, mm. It, 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 it was immediately a minus rather than a plus. Father, we've always understood each other pretty well, haven't we? Of course we have. You'll know, find us rather hard to understand, but I'm going to chuck medicine. I'm sorry. Isn't it queer that I should hate the one profession that means everything to you? Have you hated it long? Well, always, I think, but... For your sake, because I knew how set you were, I... Oh, my poor old chap. How wretched for you. Thanks for telling me anyway. Perhaps the rank organization's well, biggest mistake, and the reason the Charm School produced so few people of any note, 
was that it did not insist on its producers and directors employing the contract starlets. For many of them, their only practical experience of film acting came from stooging, standing in modestly with back to camera in screen tests for other people. That was probably in its way the beginning of the inklings of acting as far as I was concerned. For instance, when they were testing one of the female leads, which was subsequently played by Dame Flora Robson in Saraband for Dead Lovers, they tested Coral Brown, they tested Moira Lister, they tested Flora Robson herself. And I, with my back to the camera, wearing vaguely similar clothes to the character that Stuart Granger was going to play, uh, because he played the lead, I simply fed them their lines. But the experience that I gained, even in those short moments from working with such established, such fine actresses, all of whom were naturally different, started me thinking about what I should be doing. For Barbara Murray, however, stooging proved even more profitable. When Dennis Price insisted on a screen test to help him decide whether he wanted to accept the lead role in Kind Hearts and Coronets, Barbara Murray was picked to read the part which later would be played in the film by Joan Greenwood. Quite quickly, Price decided that A, Kind Hearts was too good to turn down, and B, Miss Murray was too talented to be wasting her time stooging. So... He terribly sweetly, because he was a big, big star at that time, you know, he turned his back to the camera and stooged for me for two and a half days. And I have so much to thank the lovely man for. And from that, I got Passport to Pimlico. You didn't go to the door like that. Yes, of course. It's the only sensible thing to wear in this kind of weather. Oh, don't write indecent, I call it. Whatever must that man have thought? Exactly the same as all the other men thought last year at Bournemouth. I thought I was seeing things again. Seeing things? Yes, when all that stuff fell on my head, I fancied I saw a kind of cave with a load of treasure in it. Treasure? Yes, goblets, jewels, gold coins. And... Look out, look out, it's all getting on my neck. Did you say gold coins? Generally speaking, it was always luck rather than careful planning that provided a break for any of the charm school starlets. Come on. Take, for example, the case of Peggy Evans. The role of Dirk Bogard's girlfriend in The Blue Lamp was written initially for Diana Dawes. It was then decided by the director, Basil Dearden, that he didn't want the girl to look sound and be like me. And despite the fact her name was Diana, he wanted more of a waif. And so Peggy Evans, who was very slim and had this very thin little face and looked as though she'd been starved all her life, you know, she got the part. And it was really, I think, the only big film role that Peggy ever did. I was uh, tested, the same as all the girls were, the rank organization and outside, I presume. And I went down to Ealing Studios and was told I could either do the test with or without a Cockney accent, you know. And I was just about to get married at the time. And so I did it very quickly and off. And by, uh, well, within three weeks, I was told I got the part. Where's the bag gone? I thought you were going to... Come here, Di. Where'd you get that? Bought it. What for? I said, come here, Di. You see? You've got one of these in your hands, people listen to you. Don't, Tom. It makes me nervous. That's what I mean. That's what it's for. No, Tom. I don't like it. Tom, please, it, it might go off. Doesn't make a lot of noise. No, Tom, don't! Tom! <laughs> Scare easy, don't you? What do you want to frighten me for? Don't you remember what I'm going to tell you? When we get there, act like you've never seen us before. And afterwards, keep your mouth shut, see? You don't know nothing. You understand? Yeah. By October 1948, the rank organisation's overdraft had risen to 13 and a half million pounds. Not much more than the budget for a medium-sized movie these days, but a vast fortune then. 
What's more, it swiftly became apparent that the losses for 1949 were going to be even worse. Rank was making too many films at too high a cost for too small an audience. So something drastic was clearly called for, and something drastic duly turned up, answering to the name of John Davis, who had joined the organisation as an accountant and had now risen to be managing director. Well, applying the accountant's basic principle that a penny saved is a penny earned, Davis began to cut back sharply on everything. The studios at Shepherd's Bush, Highbury and Islington were sold, Denham was part leased to 20th Century Fox, production plans were abandoned, and when option time came round, the contracts of the stars and the starlets were dropped. So by the time Davis sat back to mop his brow and stop wielding his axe and catch his breath, a newer, leaner rank organisation had come into being, and the first and most notable period of the rank charm school had come to an end. There was a good deal of, of uh, fairly fierce decision making. We can't wait. We can't wait for this or that one to develop, even if they're beginning to show signs, because we must cut down. It came to a point where economies had to be brought about, and the first cuts were people like myself. I must be honest with you, I breathed a huge sigh of relief, because I really didn't think I was going to get anywhere. And that's not meant to sound unkind, because as I've explained earlier, the idea was a wonderful one. But it wasn't put to practical use, because they didn't insist that we were given jobs. I remember I was 18 years old, and I was once again called to Olive Dodd's office. Once again, I thought, the moment has come, it's all going to be wonderful. And I walked in, and she told me very gently uh, that they were dropping my contract, and it wasn't just me. You know. And I remember walking down Regent Street, uh, thinking, what's going to happen to me now? Because since I was 15, I'd had this weekly paycheck coming in and suddenly for the first time in my young life I realized that money was really very important it wasn't just going to the studios and playing let's pretend I think it's fair to say that with his ruthless cost-cutting Davis made very few friends except perhaps among the organization's bankers rank films became more modest in every possible way but at least by 1951 Davis was able to announce that the company was once again in the black Mind you, the fact that over the next few years, the production of an annual Norman Wisdom comedy represented just about the height of the Rank organization's ambition might give you some idea of how much the Colossus had shrunk. Still, Rank did survive, and by the mid-1950s, confidence had returned to such an extent that the idea of the charm school could be mooted once again, albeit in a rather modified form. In its second incarnation, the charm school was never so strict or so formal as it had been before, though the basic notion remained the same to groom young talent and to milk it for all the publicity it was worth. One felt slightly as a sort of very ambitious young actress that she wanted to play sort of say Juliet in Romeo and Juliet and sort of really get on the, the boards and that sort of all the sort of thing you sort of became claustrophobic, claustrophobic in the, uh, the luxury of being a rank person and, and the fuss they made of you and um, you know it was very spoiling and they sort of tended to put you on show and photograph you all the time without actually sort of giving you a meaty role to get into. Everything was laid on. You know, your transport was laid on, your hairdresser was laid on, your makeup, your clothes, um, lovely food. You know, you'd go to the best hotels and uh, be put up at the best hotels, you know, um, escorted everywhere. You know, people would turn out to see you. Mm. This always surprised me because even though, you know, I felt I hadn't done very much in the way of films. It always surprised me that the public would turn out to see you. A bit like being a, a very small member of the royal family. <laughs> in the second coming of the charm school, the starlets no longer had to attend an actual school, though individual tuition was available to them. Nor at premieres were they now obliged to wear Margaret Lockwood's hand-me-downs. Instead, expensive dresses were specially designed for them. But one thing certainly hadn't changed. The young contract artists were still used primarily for publicity purposes and hardly at all for filmmaking. On the other hand, personal appearances had become rather more glamorous affairs, not so much a case of judging baby shows in Rotherham, but more a matter of helping to sell rank and its products in Europe. And it was at that time that John Davis decided he was going to try and spread the rank organization and its artists uh, and make them more internationally known. So he decided that he was going to uh, insist that we all attend. We didn't insist, it wasn't the same in, uh, then as it had been back in the 40s, but 
you were asked if you would attend these film festivals, and it was great. I mean, there was no problem about not going. I mean, because it was it was a marvelous experience. All expenses paid for, and that's where, of course, I did my famous mink bikini trip in Venice. You know, on the gondola uh, with Theo Cowan. And we did it quite early in the morning, and we had one gondola with a photographer and one gondola with doors. And I was in the doors gondola because we were trying to set the picture up. And the photographer said, the, Christ, the light's just perfect, you know. Let's do it now. Well, there was no way I could get out of the gondola. And so the only thing I could do was lie along the bottom of the thing so that none of me showed. And she had one leg on the back of my neck. And the pictures which you see of her on the lagoon are actually, you know, really by my kind permission of me trying to survive in the bowels of the canoe, the, the gondola of it. By the mid-1950s, festivals had become an important marketplace for the film industry, and Rank would round up its starlets and herd them in droves to places like Venice and Cannes, not, of course, to promote the starlets, but to promote itself. By and large, Rank's films were far less memorable than the publicity, which, thanks to the indefatigable efforts of its young actresses, verged on overkill. One thing that was lovely, we had a yacht at our disposal, so during the day when Cannes was rather full, we would escape and go out onto the, you know, out into the bay um, on this yacht. Uh, we wouldn't relax. The photographer would be there all the time, still taking photographs of everything you did on the yacht. So, in a sense, so, your personal life was controlled by the organisation? When you were on, on an official function, yes, yes. I remember being allowed to go shopping in Cannes, and the photographer came too. We had an awful lot of newspapers. It seemed to be... I don't know whether it's true to say there were more photographers, but there seemed to be many more photographic outlets and a lot more um, um, screen and film and movie magazines. And there were film annuals that used to come out every year, um, which are now very few. Um, the film publications are much fewer now, now they're all video. And so I suppose the, 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 the press's need uh, for that kind of thing was greater. And so they would, yes, they would, they would, they would turn out for almost anything and use a hell of a lot more pictures than they do now. So for the second generation of charm school starlets, as for the first, too much time was devoted to publicity, too little to learning their craft. For Susan Beaumont, indeed, it could almost be said that the biggest film she starred in was that of her own wedding. This essentially private event was recorded by the rank cameras and shown on newsreels in the cinemas to audiences that would have been hard put to it to name any other picture in which she'd appeared. I just think there should have been more liaison between the two departments, the filming department and the publicity department. You know, you shouldn't have too much publicity before you've had a chance to do any work, any acting to prove yourself. Uh, it's all the wrong way around. You know, you, you wanted the work, 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 and then, all right, publicity to follow that up. One had a lot of fun, and um, I suppose your uh, objectives were sort of lost in the acting with the fun that was involved in the glamour. You know, the glamour of the life. Mm -hmm. So you were a star without actually being a star. Whenever I see you, you seem to be in a hurry. Why? When have you seen me hurry? Playing rugby for the Harlequins. I say, have I got a fan? <laughs> well, you are quite a celebrity. Douglas, when you finish making love to Sally, what are you up to on Monday? Making love to Sally, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Richardson and I are flying over to the Reading Aero Club. Care to join up? Yep, can't be in. Where do you live, Sally? Oh, about 40 miles away. Fine, I want you home. Let's go now. Don't be silly. What about Johnny? Besides, there's Hilda. They're all right. Look. I'll get my coat. Come on, let's go. At the end of the 1950s, the rank charm school finally faded into oblivion, never to be resurrected again film studios could no longer afford to have anyone under contract. It had become far more economical to hire freelance performers as and when they were needed. So the charm school passed, more or less unmourned. For most of the girls, it had served mainly as a kind of finishing school, and for some, including Beverly Brooks, it had provided an opportunity to marry into the peerage. But apart from that, what exactly had it achieved? I think that it really did good to practically everybody who virtually everybody went there, they came away with something. The organisation, not as much as it had, they'd hoped, I think. Not, not really as much as they'd hoped. The, the, the beginning one felt that somehow you'd produce terrific stars almost straight away, instant, instant stars. It doesn't really work. 
it only works if a director and producer are determined, as they will with a child. A child can't act, and they will make it appear to act. But it's very diff different if you ask them to make an 18-year-old girl look as though she's a fine actress. It really isn't possible. A child can take that sort of direction, but, but the 18 year is already producing their own personality. So I think that, that from that point of view, it didn't do as much for the organisation as we would have liked, but I think the publicity could not have been bought. In all fairness to them, they wanted to project uh, an air of seriousness amongst their young contract players. And by calling it the Company of Youth and starting it off as they did, that was fine. But because the press had dubbed it the Charm School and everything about it was just it was ridiculed. And of course, once you're held up to ridicule, it's very difficult to get out of that bag. I think it was probably a good idea at the time. I think that they were, as I say, I, I'm sure they were more interested in finding pretty girls than they were in, in finding actors. And I suppose, I mean, if you look at the, the track record, I mean, if, if you, out of 25 girls, you find four as successful, and they did, then that, that, they didn't entirely waste their time, and Diana Dawes was a success in the word go. Well, I think it's a fallacy to say that you can build stars. <laughs> I think that, the, that, that it's individuality, not conformity, that is it's screen or stage or television magic. It's, the, it's somebody who's different, and uh, that you can't teach it or breed it. You can encourage it. But I think, quite honestly, this is where Corda scored against mm -hmm. the rank organization. He believed in talent, and he would give talent a long, long rope. Well, what did the rank organization believe in then? Uh, getting you cheap and training you up, I think. And uh, it's not a policy that really breeds big stars. It doesn't. Once, when discussing his involvement with the film industry, J. Arthur Rank said, I do this work for God and my country. Well, no doubt both God and the country were duly grateful, though it's difficult to see quite what benefit either of them derived from the Rank Charm School. True, it did encourage a few stars, notably Diana Dawes, Christopher Lee, and briefly Anthony Steele. But basically, what it turned out was a bunch of poised and well-groomed young women, some of whom made acceptable brides for the aristocracy. Nevertheless, it was a bold and even unique experiment. Foolhardy, perhaps, but a splendid triumph of optimism over experience. You see, it never really had a great chance of success because you simply cannot make a star. Performers have either got what it takes or they haven't, and there's an end of it. So though the Rank Charm School did encourage a few people who eventually became stars, it never created any stars of its own. On the other hand, it did provide quite a lot of harmless fun and amusement for a nation which, the first time round anyway, had nothing more hilarious to look forward to than Stafford Cripps and his austerity budgets. Of course, it was Sidney Box who first came up with the idea of the Company of Youth, but it was J. Arthur Rank who enabled the whole thing to develop from there. And it was strange, really, that essentially so stern a man should have had anything to do with something ultimately so frivolous. At this stage, I suppose it's difficult to say quite what praise or blame posterity will heap upon J. Arthur Rank's shoulders for the ultimate state and fate of the British film industry. But whatever it decides, I like to think that he'll be remembered for at least two things. The immortal, if somewhat indelicate, contribution his name has made to rhyming slang, and for the setting up of something which, in the end, and despite the unexpected benefit of publicity which accrued from it, was so gloriously and so quixotically daft as the Rank Charm School. <laughs>